So it's a pleasure to present Irena Das Fiesca from Memphis University. Uh, she's going to talk about control of a third order in time dynamics governing nonlinear acoustic waves. So it's a pleasure, Irena. Thank you for accepting to give this talk. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me. We had a guy's great idea <laughs> in this moment of crisis. In fact, the title of the workshop is uh, Control Theory in Crisis, yeah? <laughs> in time of a crisis. So crisis refers to the time not to control, hopefully. Eh? Um, so it's my pleasure to be here and to share with you uh, some of the research that has been done in the um uh, with, with my collabor collaborators uh so uh, this talk is going to be rather qualitative uh, because i don't know uh, i don't want to get into too many technical details but to give you rather an overview um of some of the topics related uh, and also to indicate some uh, future direction for research uh, so we talk about the third order in time dynamics, uh, which is motivated by nonlinear acoustic acoustics. Uh, so how do I go here? So I would like to uh, say that this work with uh, with many collaborators, which uh, interact various times of various for various parts of the work. Uh, and here I listed all, all of people in the alphabetic order. Marcello Bongarti is a PhD student who is right now, in fact, on a job market finishing uh, from University of Memphis. Uh, Francesca Bucci, Filippo De Loro, Barbara Kaltenbacher, who was probably one of the main motivator for me uh, personally, because she came up with a model and she started really asking a asking bunch of uh, very interesting questions. Um, and Luciano Pandolfi, Vittorino Pata, and Roberto Trigiani. So these are uh, people uh, which, uh, uh, whose work uh, uh, I'm going to report on. Uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, so what is the motivation? Overview. So what is the mot uh, motivation for studying this kind of models? Uh, they arise in a so-called uh, technology of high-frequency high fo focus ultrasound or lithotripsy. However, now uh, there is an evidence that um, applicability of the models, or I would say development of these models, is much broader, um, and it also enters areas like thermoviscolastic or thermoelasticity. Uh, and other models, when you have uh, to really decide which law for a heat transfer you are going to use, whether it's going to be an evolutionary process or static. I will, I will say more about later. Uh, so the PD models which um, arise within this context are um, basic two models. One is a Westerwald Kuznetsov equation. This is a second order in time, and the third order in time it's referred as more Gibson Thompson equation. So this is the one that is going to be here discussed. Uh, so in a Westerwald Kuznetsov equation, it's a second order in time, and in fact, it is characterized by infinite speed of propagation uh, and is of parabolic type. And precisely because of infinite speed of propagation, which is somehow physically not acceptable uh, in the, within the context of acoustic waves, when you have a heat waves which definitely uh, exhibit a finite speed of propagation, uh, there is a new model, which is this MGT uh, of third order in time, which is characterized by finite speed of propagation. And this is of hyperbolic type. So you have very different, different type of dynamics. Uh, so the questions addressed within, within this framework, uh, of course, include global well-posedness of this quasi-linear PDE models, because they're going to be quasi-linear. And our next, next, uh, next natural question is to see uh, asymptotic analysis when the relaxation time t goes to zero, which means that one that MGT somehow approaches in a certain way Westerwald equation. Um, and topic which I would like to really focus today on, uh, it's a hidden regularity from the boundary. Uh, why it is interesting? Because we know everything about wave equation and we know how much of a hidden regularity has, has been exhibited for the hyperbolic system. So it is interesting also to ask this question within the context of MGT models. And as you will see, things are a little bit surprising. 
Um, uh, then, of course, the issue of stabilization, and you have a vari variety of ways to stabilize, which can be uh, frictional memory or boundary dumping. I will concentrate on the last one, which is boundary dumping. Um, and then, um, eventually, finally, I would like to talk about the boundary uh, stabilization um, and feedback control, which is really the main focus of this talk. How to uh, use um, low regularity boundary controls in such a way to um, be able to control uh, online feedback control as a model. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the overview. Uh, what are the challenges of this kind of analysis? First of all, we deal with nonlinear wave propagation. So we have a quasi-linear equation that we have to um, handle in terms of the basic well poseness including Hadamard well poseness of solutions. Uh, and as you see, the uh, is difference between uh, third order and second order uh, is exhibited by the linear even generator of a, of a semi-group, if you linearize, which becomes singular when this time relaxation goes to zero. Um, a weak solution with rough boundary data, it is exactly something that I would like to uh, discuss uh, how to define them and what kind of regularity can be uh, obtained. Um, and boundary feedback will control problems, again, just because of the model um, of a, um, with a, with a with rough boundary data uh, would lead to a certain uh, singular non-standard Riccati equation, which have a bounded coefficient. And there have been some progress made, which I'm going to report on, but there are also many questions still uh, wide open. Uh, so in part, essentially my talk will consist of three parts. In part one, I've just reviewed the basic MGT dynamics. Review, I'll just partial review because it has been a lot of work done recently. So I'm not uh, here uh, trying to uh, pretending that I can, I can provide a thorough review, but at least focus on, the, on these topics. Uh, and then uh, the main part will be MGT from the boundary to see how the boundary data um, influence uh, dynamics of the third order equations. And the third part is on control and feedback synthesis and the co corresponding um, algebraic Riccati equations. Um, now, in terms of uh, application here, it's a typical situation when you would like to, uh, when this kind of models uh, can be applied and are motivated by. Uh, so this is a case of lithotripsy. So you have, you have, a, you have a certain, you have a body, you have a tumor in the, within the body, like or, or kidney stone. Uh, it's, it's a certain um, target point that you want to hit with a with a race with a uh, with a focus uh, with a focus uh, race uh, transmitted or emitted by uh, high uh, intensity focus ultrasound transducer um, and. The surrounding uh, the environment, it's typically uh, you have wave, uh, acoustic waves or sometimes gas. Okay, so there are various, various configurations. So the control problems that you have in mind is that it's, uh, you will be implementing control on the, on the boundary on the this, on this side. Here, as you see, it's a convex surface and that will be important for further consideration. Um, uh, and then you want to hit with this uh, race uh, uh, exactly the lesion, which is a specified point with the body. So, uh, so this is a, one of the probably um, uh, one of the applications which uh, motivates exactly uh, this kind this kind of analysis. Uh, why this kind of a control problem? I, I, okay, and there's here another uh, picture which also will be related to the control problem. So we have uh, here an uh, environment which is an acoustic wave. We have a focal point which is here in the middle, and the control is going to be uh, implemented on this uh, site over uh, on this disk uh, via some piezoceramic or piezoelectric uh, devices, which are going to be, of course, in uh, will introduce also some hit flux, okay? Uh, so this is, a, this is a situation that we want to deal with. So this already, I already have this overview. No, I cannot, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry about this. 
Uh, so more than I'm, I'm going to just very briefly say what the main quantities in the equation are, um, but there, is, there has been a lot of literature regarding the modeling. Uh, so we, uh, rom is usually means uh, denotes mass, de mass, mass density and v uh, it's a vector, it's acoustic partic particle velocity. So the first equation is uh, mass conversation, um, conservation, a typical equation. The second equation, as you see, it's also a very familiar equation of uh, uh, related to, of course, uh, the propagation of waves. Uh, and the third one, it's a entropy equation, eta, it's entropy equation. Uh, and Q that denotes a heat flux, uh, capital T, it's a Cauchy Poisson stress, and D is a deformation tensor. C, it's a speed, speed of sound. Yeah, so there will be another parameter which is important. It comes exactly in a definition of this uh, Cauchy Poisson tensor. Now, the variable in which uh, the acoustic waves here are go going to be considered, and in fact, this is the idea uh, introduced by um, Kuznetsov and Lesser Sibas, and also later uh, developed by Kaltenbacher and, and her group, uh, and also Pedro Jordan, uh, who works uh, in a Navy lab, and he's, he has done uh, a lot of work and wrote many, many papers, uh, which relate to the modeling. So the quantities in which we are going to consider this um, model are um, either we are, we are taking velocity as a gradient of the potential psi or uh, velocity of the time derivative of the velocity, so the acceleration as a gradient of pressure. So if you uh, take these variables as um, um, in which you want to uh, formulate equation, uh, uh, then uh, the equation of the following form. Uh, depending on how do we model heat flux, if we model statically, okay, the classical Fourier law, okay, then the corresponding nonlinear acoustic wave becomes written in a pressure, you know, where P is a pressure variable. Um, uh, it has left-hand side, which is a classical strongly damped wave equation, so you know almost everything about it. And this is a nonlinear term, which involves second time derivative of a square of a pressure and square of also a velocity. This will be for Kuznetsov. Uh, in, instead, if you introduce a Catania law, which is going to account for a finite speed of propagation, okay? So you have this parameter tau, this parameter of relaxation, small parameter tau. Uh, introduced to the equation, then what is happening, uh, so we get a third order in time here on the left-hand side, okay? Uh, and as I said, the modeling is done by people like Jodran Pe uh, Pedro, Ivan Kristoff and Christoph Kristoff from Stanford and Brian Strogan. Uh, and also my personal thanks to Maurizio Fab um, Mauro Fabrizio, uh, who provided a lot of explanation um, um, regarding the physics of of this model. Uh, so if you want to write it down equation in a friendly way, just a mathematical formulation, then uh, you can see that it's a, uh, for Westerwald equation, uh, it's a relatively um, simple form when you have this nonlinearity here, second order, and, and you now means a generic solution, which could be either pressure or velocity potential. Uh, and then eventually you have uh, two features of this equation. It's a quasi-linearity because the principal part depends on the solution and can in fact degenerate. And you have on the right-hand side square of the pressure. So this is just writing down explicitly this form. So uh, Westerwald equation second order is characterized by potential degeneracy uh, and also the nonlinear term on the right-hand side. Um, so the result, okay, that goes back on more than 10 years ago, it's a well posedness of solutions, global well posedness of solution for this equation. Uh, and the way we measure the solution uh, topologically, uh, it's a, essentially a space which corresponds to, as you see, a, a lot of derivatives, uh, two derivatives in space and two derivatives in time. So the highest order. Uh, and gradient. So this is, if you consider this as a topological measure of the solution, one can show that assuming that initial data are sufficiently small in this topology, 
uh, then there exists a unique solution. And in fact, the solution is global. Uh, globality is, of course, related to some decay rates which have to be proved within, within the you know, framework. Okay. Uh, now, let me just go to the MTG uh, equation, which involves Catania law and finite speed of propagation. So what we have here, we have here this parameter tau, which is uh, thermal relaxation, which uh, is a result from the Fourier law replaced by Catania law. And here we have this uh, right-hand side written down explicitly uh, on, on the equation. So it's again, uh, coefficient alpha here describes natural damping effects uh, in, in the medium, yeah, in the acoustic environment. So this is the equation uh, that, that we uh, obtain. Uh, here I'm just quoting from one of the papers by Bob Strogan. Uh, the third time derivative is typically in extended irreversible thermodynamics. Uh, and this is a theory which was proposed in order to remove a property of propagation, it's a paradox okay, um, of propagation of heat and velocity signals with an infinite velocity when Fourier uh, Navier-Stokes equations are used. Uh, the idea behind is that these physical quantities, such as the thermodynamic fluxes typically given by constitutive relation, uh, in extended uh, irreversible thermodynamics are governed by evolution equations. So that was exactly Catania law. Uh, so here to summarize, for tau equals zero, we have a parabolic light problem, Kuznetsov equation, for tau positive, it's a hyperbolic. Um, interestingly enough, uh, this really is this model in one dimension was introduced already by Professor Stokes um, in his paper in 1851. So that's an exactly uh, in, in the same context uh, to remove um, uh, paradox of infinite speed of propagation. Uh, now, of course, if you want to somehow convince yourself that we are dealing with hyperbolic dynamics, because historically I have to say that there were a number of papers when somehow people still thought that it was a parabolic um, behavior of this, uh, of this model, uh, the best thing is just to run some spectral analysis and see what happens with the spectrum. Um, so the typical behavior, you have uh, three branches, this third order equation, uh, that's of course for linear model, and what happens, you have uh, two branches which uh, approach asymptotically vertical lines with some, let's say, real part negative, and there is a third real part uh, which corresponds to the parabolicity in the equation uh, with a point of accumulation, so this is a point spectrum, okay? So we have infinitely many eigenvalues converging to this point. Uh, okay, now if you look, for example, at the uh, influence of the diffusion in this equation, so the, uh, in some sense, parabolicity, uh, then you can see what is happening that these lines, these vertical lines, you know, with a beads parameter of diffusion, uh, they become more shifted to the left, okay? So the green one is, is, uh, correspond to the highest, okay? And again, this uh, line on a, um, a real line, it is uh, uh, this end point, it's a point of continuous spectrum. The uh, resolvent is, of course, not compact for the, uh, for the problem. Um, perhaps, you know, being on this picture, I just want to emphasize that uh, when we'll be looking at the question, what happens when a parameter of relaxation goes to zero, uh, so one can show that, in fact, for the linear problem, the spectrum, it's um, upper semi-continuous, and these lines, which have this vertical asymptote, escape to minus infinity. So in some sense, you know, the, the whole picture uh, becomes parab uh, parabolic, but the, the asymptotes are farther and farther away to the, to the left, okay? So this is what's happening when tau goes to zero. Uh, uh, also, depending on the parameters, the problem might be completely unstable and might have even positive uh, real eigenvalues because uh, I'll discuss this in a moment. Uh, it depends on the configuration between the coefficient, okay? Um, so this is, this is a picture corresponding. So, so here, it was supposed to be a movie, but I'm unable to play this movie. So what is happening is as the eigenvalues uh, we enfolding to the horizontal line, and there is part of a continuous spectrum which is uh, concentrated, uh, converges to this point here. So, so this is this is a characteristic of the equation. Uh, 
So abstract formulation uh, is, is already mentioned. So this is a for faster part. We have here parameter, which is the generate uh, for MDT. This parameter appears in a second time derivative. And uh, I took this, um, I, uh, this does not have a gradient uh, velocity, but uh, this is uh, good enough. Uh, script A corresponds as always to the negative Laplacian with zero boundary condition, either Neumann or Dirichlet, depending on the, on the model. Uh, so let me just remind some basic results um, which have been obtained almost 10 years ago. Um, first of all, in case of a linear model, when is this k is equal to zero, so this parameter of nonlinearity. Uh, so in case of Westerwald, uh, this is a result that has been known, I don't know, for 40 years probably. Uh, when tau is equal to zero, then the semigroup is exponentially stable, if and only if this damping coefficient is strictly positive, yeah, alpha. Um, and of course, okay, B has to be positive for the third order equation because otherwise the problem is ill posed to begin with. And that is result goes back to Fattorini. So this constant B diffusivity uh, has to be positive. Uh, however, if you look at MDT, third order equation, then stability is really conditioned upon, um, con upon uh, exponential stability. Uh, depends uh, whether uh, uh, coefficient gamma, which is we call uh, coefficient corresponding to stability, uh, which is exactly alpha, it's uh, natural damping in acoustic media, tau is uh, relaxation, B is diffusivity, C squared is the speed of sound. Okay, So if this quantity is positive, then we have exponential stability. Otherwise, uh, problem can be unstable and even chaotic. Uh, now, what happened for the nonlinear system? Because it's, of course, important to have stability results for the linear system. So, assuming that uh, problem uh, that we have a coefficient gamma strictly positive, uh, then one obtains a global solution uh, for initial data, which are small with respect to this topology. Third order equation. Uh, you, you, you have to impose three initial conditions. Okay? So this is topology H2, H1, and L2, that's with appropriate boundary conditions depending on the situation. Um, so this is a result that I also do know I, uh, I had with Barbara Kaltenbacher. Uh, uh, and in case of Westerwald, uh, there is a nice paper by Matthias Wilke and Meyer, uh, when they use, in fact, uh, um, Sobolev uh, LP spaces uh, to obtain the results on a global solvability for Westerwald equation, which, but this is a para maximal regularity and parabolic problem, okay, as opposed to hyperbolic. So this is situation uh, in, in terms of the well postness. Uh, so as I mentioned, parameter of stability is this quantity alpha minus tau c square over, over b. And the energy function with which we are working uh, are exactly corresponding to this norm, which is H2, H1, and L2. This is for L2. Uh, and it's important that for linear problems exponentially can be shown um, exponentially stable owing to positivity of the parameter. Uh, so the proof goes via, I would say right now, the barrier method, which is the usual method used for hyperbolic equations. Uh, perhaps it's uh, talking about the original, or original proof requires smallness of um, initial data with respect to the full topology. And that, that will have to be relaxed um, as uh, you will see uh, in a moment. Uh, now, what happened uh, when you look at the critical case, namely that this gamma is equal to zero, uh, then of course there are some other ways of introducing stability into the system. Uh, and there are several options. One, one of them is a memory dumping. So you introduce a memory term. Uh, and there is a work by Filippo De Loro, Vittorino Pata, Xiaojin Wang, um, uh, myself that uh, 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 analyzes, okay, what kind of a properties of the kernel uh, are needed in order that this memory term stabilizes the system. The situation is quite different than wave equation or say, uh, which kind of, you know, one can think that way because the uh, calibration of the coefficient a and b in front of the position and velocity is very important. Otherwise, you might get only polynomial stability or other types. So, but that was, that has been done and I will not be 
um, uh, discussing much, but just want to point it out that there is uh, a large amount of literature. Uh, there is also a possibility of for linear model uh, to stabilize from the from the interior with some localized damping, and there is there are some papers by Sergey says um, addressing this issue. Uh, in this talk, I want to focus on a boundary damp of a, on a damping on the part of the boundary and to see uh, what can be done, what can be said in this case. Uh, so let me just spend a little bit of time uh, in discussing asymptotic analysis, what happens when the tau goes to zero. So uh, uh, parameter relaxation. As I already mentioned, uh, spectra, if just for the linear problem, you can see that this vertical asymptotes go uh, converge to minus infinity, they disappear, okay? They disappear asymptotically. But one would like to show rigorously uh, that the solution in a certain topology, you have some uh, convergence. Uh, what is the issue if you look at the proof? Uh, first of all, I'm just, even in the linear case, you would think of a Trotter-Cato type of a theorem, but uh, generator is singular, so of course you cannot do this. Um, um, another issue is a quasi-linearity uh, because that requires initial data small. If you assume, if you look at some different methods of showing asymptotic stability, you have to play differential of topologies uh, and eventually some density uh, arguments, and you have to be careful uh, how small is small. So you cannot assume smallness in the topology, which is which is which is high in a sense, because then density will not give you uh, the result that you that you uh, try to obtain. And I'm going to explain. Um, and in fact, this uh, question of uh, what happened when uh, with a model when tau goes to zero was addressed recently by Kaltenbacher and Nikolic, and they have two papers. Um, and they were able to show weak convergence, uh, weak convergence of solution. Uh, here, I just wrote it down in the simplest cases, generator is depending of linear model, depending on tau, so you see that there's singularity uh, just in front. Uh, so weak convergence is based on estimates on some estimates of the solutions which are independent on tau. Uh, 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 open, however, uh, the argument would not lead to the strong yeah. convergence. Um, uh, in the, the, however, there was a numerical evidence, a strong convergence, uh, numerical evidence provided by this author in the paper, the strong convergence really should be taking place. The so question was how to exhibit um, rigorously uh, the strong convergence. Uh, and as I said, the main reason, the main difficulty was related to um, quasi-linearity and the way of uh, introducing smallness of, of the initial data, uh, which should not penalize uh, higher derivatives. Uh, so strong convergence was an open problem, and that is, uh, that is a problem that I was looking with Marcello Bongarti, uh, how to resolve. Uh, and I will, I'm just going to, uh, perhaps I will just go to the statement. So. Um, uh, in fact, uh, one can prove that if you take initial data in the topology, the basic topology in which you have a well poseness of this of this equation, which is H2, H1, L2. I don't put here boundary condition because depending on the model. Uh, and with uh, smallness only in the smallest topology. So this is exactly the base space topology, which is, uh, a, which is only H1, H1, L2. Uh, we one can prove a strong convergence of solutions. So what does it what does it mean? It means that I'm just if you have a solution corresponding to the third order equation, so you have a three coordinate coordinates here. So this p means projection on the first two, and you compare with the solution to the second order equation, but corresponding to the data which are projected, um, and we obtain a strong convergence exactly in the correct topology of the model. Uh, and uh, this is possible because uh, and because the estimates, so perhaps uh, we also have a rate of convergence as you see requires higher higher norms. Uh, and here the main issue was precisely to calibrate um, smallness of the base energy space. So we had to get, obtain the estimates when smallness was required only on um, on the on the small on the on the first level of energy. There are three levels of energy for this problem, uh, and that was possible to do this thing. 
and then showing invariance of this tightness of the smallness of the dynamics, was allowing to carry the proof of asymptotic convergence. Uh, and also another aspect of this problem, you have to have a control of singularity uh, with respect to tau of the 10 derivative. So this is the principal part. So these three points, okay, essentially allow to go from weak convergence to strong convergence. So now we know the solution converges strongly. Uh, and this is the result, strong converted semi-group and also decay rates provided data are small, small enough. And in fact, this decay, strong convergence is uniform in time. Now, let me go to part two, which is uh, uh, part related to behavior um, with non-trivial uh, boundary data and how to uh, how to look at this uh, at these questions? Uh, so we are looking at MDT. So tau is positive, fixed. Uh, the solution has a three coordinates: u, u t, and u double t. So a question asked, natural question, just motivated by by study of uh, you know, wave equation and famous hidden regularity. Uh, so if you look at the equation, the total equation, and this is just a linear model, as you see, uh, and you assume the data are zero on the boundary. Uh, you would like to know what happens with a normal derivative of that solution, okay? Whether there is something more than interior regularity that right now we know everything about it, uh, you can predict. Uh, and similarly, the second part is if you put a boundary data G on the boundary, okay, uh, say in L2, uh, then you will be looking also at the uh, regularity of uh, no, 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 regularity of the solution and regularity of the normal derivative. Okay, so these are the questions, and we know what's happening in, uh, for wave equation. I'm going to, in fact, to review this thing very briefly for those who perhaps didn't have occasion to look at the problem. Um, so just uh, uh, brute, uh, if you apply the very straightforward arguing, argument, which I call brutal force, which means interior regularity plus trace theorem, if you start with initial data in the space H, H sub one, which I call, which is a base state space for the a solution, it is H2, H1, and L2. And then you ask a question, what happened with a normal derivative? Uh, so if I have element in H2, the normal derivative by trace theorem is going to be in H1 half, okay? So that is kind of an ex, uh, can, can one do better, okay? So the question is, do we have a hidden regularity? Can we do something better than just this H1 half? Because this will be straightforward from well possible. So just to introduce the problem. Uh, and here I'm going to say a few things about wave equation just to put uh, to, uh, to put things in the context. So if, we, if you look at the wave equation uh, driven by initial data in some forcing term F, uh, and you look at the map F is in L1, L2, and initial data are H1, L2, classical energy space plus some boundary condition. So we know very well solution is also H1, L2. Okay, so brutal force. If you ask a question, what happens with a normal derivative? So function is H1. So if you apply formally even, uh, you get H negative half, okay? But it's, it's formal, it's not here. Instead, the result of known on wave equation uh, tells you that normal derivative is in L2. So this is what is referred as hidden regularity. Uh, and similarly, if you feed the equation with a normal data, uh, with a boundary data, which are in H1, okay? Then one obtains also that normal derivative of that solution is in L2. So it means that all the boundary behavior, it's um, 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 all the derivatives on the boundary are L2. So this is so-called gain of one half derivative with respect to the uh, interior regularity plus the trace, okay? Um, uh, if you take instead a G in L2 only for the wave equation, then solution is in L2, velocity is H negative one, but normal derivative is in H negative one. So again, gain of one half derivative with respect to the um, trace story. So that is right now known and there are many ways of uh, proving this thing. And I'm going to perhaps say, okay, we call, this result is often, I think, referred as hidden regularity. And so I think, 
uh, I want to convey a message that perhaps is not so hidden. It depends how do you look at it. Uh, I should say that the, this paper here I'm quoting with Leon, it uses multipliers method as a method of, of, of uh, showing uh, this hidden regularity. However, uh, the whole idea really goes back to a couple of years before when, um, in fact, inspired by method of Sakamoto and pseudo differential calculus um, and hyperbolic system, uh, in showing that in, if you start with element in L2, then you get a solution also in L2 and normal derivative H negative one. So this is exactly hidden regularity statement. Uh, and what is the simplest way to see without really getting in and, into any calculations or multipliers? It's just a Fourier analysis. Uh, and this argument here is very simple because I'm doing on a half space, normal tangentials. And of course, if you want to have a bounded domain, you have to localize and there are commutators and there's, there is quite, quite a lot of um, technicalities. But the idea just to see what is true, what is not, is immediate just from this calculation. So if I want to solve a wave equation, uh, and look at the hidden regularity. So what I do, I send time to the Fourier variable, a tangential uh, component also to the Fourier variable eta, and I'm looking at the equation in a normal direction. So this is a classical way of looking at the uh, problem as a hyperbolic system. So we solve Fourier time and space, um, um, and instead in a normal direction, we have just an ODE. So this is a symbol corresponding to this Fourier variables. So you can just, uh, you have on the boundary function G and I take zero initial data. So the solution is explicitly given as a Fourier transform of a boundary data times this exponential uh, given by X. And this is a positive uh, or say negative real part of that number. Uh, now this number here, it's what, it's a, a first order pseudo differential operator, time and space, okay? So you can see it immediately. So if you take a normal derivative of this wave equation, so you put x equal to zero, so you have a first order tangential operator applied to the L2 function. So of course it is in H negative one. Uh, and solution itself is in L2 by direct calculation. So this is something that you cannot really miss. Uh, it's a very simple argument. And of course, you know, you have to do the same for a full domain um, by localizing, but this is a core of argument, okay? Uh, now for Neumann problem, situation is a little bit, uh, it's different, you don't have a, you have hidden regularity, but less or less of it, so to speak. But also in order to see what do you get, uh, uh, I'm going to do the same time of a Fourier analysis. So the same, the same, the same construct, but assuming that normal derivative is given on the boundary L2 function. So we have this condition. So what is happening is the solver in Fourier variable has this extra square root in the denominator. Now, if you think, if you compare Dirichlet with Neumann, so perhaps the natural intuition is that Neumann should behave by one derivative better. This is false in two dimension, and you will see immediately why. Uh, this better, better regularity should really uh, result from the existence of this operator of this fraction here in the denominator. Here, okay, keep in mind that S is alpha plus I beta, so this does not de de degenerate because I have some real part alpha. So don't worry about this being zero. Uh, so what we do, we just look, first of all, what happened on the boundary. So you take X equals zero. So you have exactly the symbol which tells you everything about the solution to the Neumann problem. And now here, there is something that is typical for two and higher dimension, but it's not, uh, no, does not, it's not true for one dimension. If you write it down in terms of the complex variables, okay, S is equal alpha plus I beta, alpha is a real part, beta it's run on R, and eta, this is a symbol. This is a real part of symbol, this is imaginary part of symbol. And you can see that this square root, which is here, it's not a first order operator. It's not a coercive, okay, that's important. It is first order operator, but not coercive in tangential direction. The reason is that in characteristic sector, when eta is equal to beta, so it's exactly characteristic sector for wave equation, you get benefit only from the imaginary part, okay? So it gets only essentially beta. If you take a square root of it, then it gives you only one half improvement. So the upshot of this thing is that in the solution on the boundary, instead of being H1, it's only H1 half, okay? Um, and in fact, here the situation, if you want to prove this thing rigorously uh, for um, 
wave equation. Uh, so you have to account for geometry and commutators. And this is result, uh, my joint work with Roberto in 89. And then Tataru got involved. In fact, he proved that uh, numbers which are here are optimal. And in fact, he has some other geometries when it's even a little bit higher concave locally. Uh, and the final result is that if you take a Delambertian, which is driven by L2 Neumann data with zero initial condition, so what you get, you get solution in H to third. So there is one third derivative missing with respect to finite energy or expectation, and boundary is one third. Calculation before we're showing one half. So where, 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 where is this difference? This is not as good as one half because of commutators. So there is a real loss and Tataru shows that you cannot, you cannot do any better. So there are counterexamples. So it's not in H1. Uh, the fact that it's not H1 was even noticed by old paper by Rausch in 78. Uh, in one dimension, of course, a Neumann problem with L2 data is H1. Uh, so the final result on, a, a, say, if you take a, here's for Dirichlet data on hidden regularity for the wave equation, we obtain that the solution in H1, L2, a normal derivative in L2, uh, it's controlled by the initial data in the same space and boundary data in H1. So this is somehow what is called uh, hidden regularity for Dirichlet. And as I said, there are several methods of doing things these days as a video calculus, which is uh, goes back to Fourier, mu multipliers applied to smooth solution. Definition of the solution with the weak data is done by duality transposition or by semi-group methods. Uh, but also uh, the original really uh, approach was a reduce, uh, reduction to the first order hyperbolic system uh, by following uh, work of Maida, Kreis, Osher, and Sakamoto, because Sakamoto has a very nice book. Uh, with the results on a first order hyperbolic system. So, so there are many methods of looking at hidden regularity, but I wanted to make point was not that hidden if you look right way. So now let me say, let me go back, let me just talk about MDT equation. And then you can see that here, uh, we have the step derivative and I ask the same question. Yeah, is a use driven by boundary data in L2. So first of all, it's important to have a definition of a solution. So because what happens, there are several works right now, I think that you can probably find on the internet. Uh, and some of it, and some, okay, several lead to the counterexample, which I'm going to display in a moment. And the reason for this is a, a misunderstanding that the definition of a solution is more tricky in a case of a third order equation and wants to be very careful what the solution mean, okay? Uh, but we want to ask a question, what happens with this, um, uh, with the solution? So if the data are in L2, you would, you would probably hope that solution, your solution should be in L2, at least. And then higher derivatives are going to be in a dual spaces. Uh, so let me just write down uh, the problem, the, this linear problem in terms of the generator. So generator is exactly this matrix operator script A, it's a Laplacian with a zero boundary data. Uh, and then you can write down this generator, in fact, uh, as a principal part. So you can take C and alpha equals zero because this is not going to impact regularity and put this as a perturbation and just look only in this matrix here as a main one. And that's a very simple, very simple thing to analyze. So if you look at the simplified model, so it's a very simple equation, okay? elementary equation, three times derivatives equals Laplacian of Wt, everything zero, and W equals G on the boundary. Okay, so essentially, so I ask a question, now I would like to analyze uh, regularity of solutions corresponding to this data. So then obvious thing to do, obvious toy, as we say, is to set it up uh, Wt velocity as a new variable, and you are just looking at the wave equation, okay? wave equation on the boundary is time derivative, okay? So it's so totally trivial reduction to wave uh, equation. In fact, this trick of changing variables, okay, uh, for full model is say, okay, has to change of variables a little more complex. Here is just time derivative. Uh, has been used essentially in almost all of the works, okay, written on the subject. So it's a very natural way. But point I want to make that that is not going to work when you look from the boundary. So. So you have this um, wave equation driven by time derivative. 
Uh, and I said, okay, so let's see what happened for smooth data. Okay, forget, forget about L2 data. What happened about smooth data so I can differentiate this G? So take a function G identically equal one, which is certainly C infinity. So the time derivative is zero. Okay, so if it's zero, because initial data are zero, uh, we get a solution identically zero. Uh, and this is, of course, nonsense because you can solve this thing by hands, and you can see that in this case, if I take g equal one, uh, the solution should correspond to characteristic function zero and one across characteristic line um, and delta function for the velocity. Uh, so what is going wrong? Because correct solution of the problem, say in one d case, and this is in fact calculation that I have to um, uh, you know. The, um, give credit to Matthias Heller uh, that the function is because uh, that was exactly discussion what happened with L2 data uh, that solution is uh, really on a characteristic function uh, on the characteristic sector and time derivative is a delta function. So of course delta function is not equal to zero and from this kind of a change of variable which is very natural tool we will get a completely wrong uh, solution and that's exactly what I somehow would like to work people who probably uh, come from the wave equation and do things naturally reducing to wave equation. So what, what is behind? It brings up the issue, what is the solution, correct solution to this problem? Correct solution to, in fact, uh, regu re regular data. Uh, one way of looking is from the point of view of hyperbolic system. So you, you are uh, converting the system to the first order hyperbolic system and try to use a theory of Sakamoto, Kreis, Maida, Osher uh, to, to, uh, to bring to this kind of a model. Uh, so what you do is the same thing as for, we did for wave equation, we send time into Fourier variable, uh, tangential also to Fourier variable, and we solve in a normal direction, uh, right as a symbol, so there is a change of variable here, three variables, which is, each of them uh, described in terms of the original solution. And you can solve on the band that it's exactly the same way as uh, original thing for the wave equation uh, as a derivative in X equals a first order hyperbolic um, metric system applied to the three variables, okay? Now, so what is happening, it's hyperbolic. However, it's not symmetric, but this is not a major issue because now we know how to symmetrize hyperbolic system. But here the issue is that you have here uh, this element zero, which means that problem is characteristic on the boundary. So this is the thing that is, you can see from this point of view that MGT, when looking on the boundary, it introduces completely new phenomena and you have to deal with a characteristic problem on the boundary. And this was, uh, there is a paper by Mattia Seller and also Francesca Bucci, um, which is on archive, and they approach the problem from the point of view of the system, and they develop theory of a, um, solvability from the boundary, but with a smooth, smooth boundary data. Uh, so what are the consequences of this characteristic uh, boundary? Uh, if problem is non-characteristic, the basic theory of hyperbolic systems, Sakamoto, Kreis, and my dime, give us the references, gives you the following nice estimate for the third order system. That if you feed the problem with initial data in H2, H1, L2, uh, function F is L2, L2, and function G boundary is in H2, so this is a, so you obtain what? You obtain solution in the same, it's a semi-group estimate for the, C means continuous in time, uh, but also you obtain two trace, two normal derivatives, okay? So you see that there is a, the problem on the boundary behaves essentially, there is no, there is no loss due to trace, uh, uh, due to trace theorem, which is as a way of saying there is a hidden regularity, okay? Because you have used that with H2 and you, got, you are getting also normal derivatives, okay? All the, second derivatives, so all the second derivatives on the boundary. But this is true for non-characteristic boundary, okay? However, in the characteristic boundary, of course, you cannot, you cannot use estimates. So what happens, so there is a, this new work by Bucci and Eller, uh, which they prove for smooth solution. They do get this estimate via hyperbolic system theory, but what do they get? They get only the first term, okay? They don't get the second derivative. 
there is no estimate on a second derivative. In fact, it's not not true. So that exactly exhibits a problem of being characteristic. Uh, so this I'll be head. Uh, so now, uh, if you go, if I go back right now to the problem with rough boundary data, um, then if I take the simplified model, so as mentioned, the question is what is the what is the definition of solution? And definition of a solution is here more um, subtle, uh, and here definition that that we are providing is in terms of a sine and cosine operator. Uh, and the generator. So these are the integral formulas which define possible in a, in a unique way solution due to the input G. G is in L2 only. D is a Dirichlet map, which means harmonic extension. Okay. Uh, and by doing, uh, by essentially working, uh, one can show that this definition is a correct, is consistent, and uh, in case of a smooth data, provides exactly uh, conditions which you want. Uh, and regularity which you obtain is exactly the one that you expect L2 in the interior for, uh, for a pressure itself, derivative H negative one. The pathology is in a second derivative. You don't get continuity in domain of a dual because there is a component which is only L2, okay? It, it comes from the re representation. So that, that is what is happening for, uh, for MDT with boundary data, which are only in L2. Uh, in a general case, when you don't look at the simplified model, but full model, the solution of it is given by um, this uh, formula over here, explicit formula via the singular integrals. Uh, and uh, it's a question that becomes an issue that the solution, the definition, it's a correct because it defines, it is defined by the closable operator. So if you take L2, then you get a solution in some dual space, so it is a closable. Uh, however, the main thing is, of course, you want to boost regularity of these terms, and the red one is the one that probably you, you lose the derivative because you have this unbounded operator in front, but also you have here, okay? But this is a correct definition of the solution to the L2, L2 data. Uh, and the theorem that is obtained uh, is exactly that if you start with initial data L2, H negative one and domain of a dual. So this is like, it's not H negative two, but it's dual to the domain and G is in L2. So there exists unique solution, which keeps the first two coordinates as expected. Uh, second derivative, it's less regular, but most important normal derivative is in H negative one, which is the nice thing because that's what you would expect from the wave equation. Uh, and this, re this result, okay, there are several sources now. There is a paper by Roberto uh, in 2018 published in SOTA. Uh, Bucci Pandolfi has a very nice, interesting paper, which is also already published in Journal Evolution Equation, when they approach the problem from the point of view of Volter integral equation. So they have a they don't, they don't get a normal, it's not a full, there are some partial results in the first, in the first two lines, okay, also in this paper. And now we have a paper under preparation uh, with Marcello Bongarti, just essentially finished. Uh, so what are the tools for proving our hidden regularity for the sine and cosine integral operators, okay? So we can exhibit this gain of one half derivative just by looking at the same group. Uh, so you see that MDT is it's tricky, but it's not eventually you can get results at least that you know. Uh, now I have a very little time, but I want to go uh, talk a little bit about a control problem. So having, having understood what's going on on the boundary and how to model the equation, uh, then we are moving into the control problem. And here I have to um, mention uh, the formulation of the problem in fact comes from the um, work of Barbara Kaltenbacher and Clayson, uh, when they look at the very specific um, uh, ultrasound model, when you have a normal band, when you work with a normal band, uh, um, with a Neumann boundary condition. Uh, by the way, Neumann boundary condition, now when, when, once we understand how to define Dirichlet, it can be also done for the Neumann with a regularity as mentioned, um, uh, two thirds yeah, in the interior. Not, not one. 
Uh, so uh, this is a problem that control acts on a portion of the boundary and there is an absorbing boundary condition on the other part, on the other part. Uh, uh, and then you uh, work uh, with a problem. Uh, so the original work and what you try to do, you minimize uh, pressure or with respect to some given profile, which is UD, with a control stick. An original work which goes on a couple of years ago, uh, they were considering controls very, very smooth and working with maximum principle, um, proving optimality conditions, sensitivity, and other uh, quantities. So the main point I want to make, uh, you would like to do only with controls in L2. Okay, the smooth, because you see this function of controls really has many, many derivatives. Okay, and there, is, there are several papers by these people. Uh, Okay, so I want to move on a case when it's non-smooth control cell two, and also bring time to infinity. So or we have a good control, what happens with a uh, even transient, but as a function of time. So the time to infinity. So the problem formulated is that on the one part, there is a G control, there is an absorption on another part, and we control with L2 data. This is exactly the picture that I show with the beginning with the piezoelectric actuators acting on this convex part. Uh, and there is an absorbing binary condition on other part of the fluid. Okay, And you want to solve this problem. So here, main thing, first thing to, to address is the question of stability. What happens with the uh, stability of equation when you deal uh, with, with this absorption by absorbing boundary, with essentially boundary dumping? And there is result uh, with Marcello Bongarty, which shows that in fact, in this case, uh, one obtains exponential decay for a, okay, for a nonlinear model, assuming the data is small in this lowest topology. But for linear model, so there is, of course, no assumption on the smallness. So there is right now a full result of an exponential decay of solutions corresponding uh, to the boundary problem. Is it critical to uh, deal with this uh, control problem? Uh, so once we know that n control model uh, will have, OK, can be stabilizable, because uh, notice that the result here requires Neumann boundary conditions. Um, on the control part, which also will have a U, but this means that you, you can stabilize with the control. Uh, so it's stabilizable. Uh, then the thing is what to see what is a solution. And here our formula for solution is critical because the solution is described exactly uh, in a following term, in a following form, when this operator uh, act, um, input output okay, dynamics, when operator L acts on G, which is only in L2. And you have here all this unboundness in front of these integrals. But now we know how to, how to deal with this. And there is also a pathology because there is this addition here of, the, of this term. Operators B0 and B1 are typical boundary operators. And it's a Neumann extension, harmonic extension. A, it's a Laplacian with Neumann boundary condition. So this is a classical notation. Uh, and the generator of a linear part uh, is this form which has which accounts for this um, dissipation on part on portion of the boundary, uh, and we want to minimize in a finite energy space, which is h1, h1, l2, uh, this functional here. Okay, uh, I put here r because the original model u minus u d can be represented with a with an appropriate r on a basic space, so we have a more general formulation for the control problem. So the difficulties, of course. Uh, this unbounded coefficient, which are in the in the unbounded dynamics, but we do we do have uh, tools for studying uh, the regularity, uh, and of course the boundary operators are enclosable. This is known. Uh, I should say there is a paper with Francesca Bucci when we uh, look at the problem um, of the tar, but on a finite time horizon without stability. Uh, and we have we have the result on optimal control uh, and also on existence of uh, Riccati equation for the finite time. So this paper was, uh, was giving quite a lot of details in terms of the technicalities. Uh, so we try to do right now is to extend to infinite time horizon uh, and also get a, get the sink from the boundary. 
So we've had, we have a boundary stability for linear dynamics because this is a recent theorem with uh, Mongarty. Uh, analysis of boundary dynamics, we have an input output formula. So the next thing is analysis of Riccati equation with unbounded coefficient. I'll just show you how this Riccati equation looks like. Uh, and what are the issues that you need to resolve? So first of all, the existence results gives you that if you start with initial data, which is in this very rough space, but that means that position pressure is in L2, velocity and uh, second derivatives are. Um, and because that's exactly characterization of the domains that exist unique control in capital U C in L2, such that the observation, let's say, defined as uh, in, in space Y, which corresponds exactly to the measurement of the pressure in, with respect to the given data. Uh, main thing is that there, there exist value operators, self adjoint positive operator, which we call Riccati, Riccati operator. Uh, which also represents a um, value fun function, such that it has the following regularity. So you see there is a lot of regularity um, of this uh, Riccati operator here because A is of course unbounded. Uh, so this is not typical for in any sort of a infinite dimensional theory of Riccati equation because that it has to do with a specific observation or properties of observation that we are considering. Um, and but this is uh, on the other hand, this is essential as, otherwise the whole analysis would be formal. So we have to prove that this Riccati operator, which is constructed via optimization, satisfies this regularity. In addition, satisfies this non standard Riccati equation. And why is non standard? Uh, you take the first three terms, so these are very standard, but the nonlinear term, which is here, is very non standard because the standard will have just this products over here. Okay. Um, and this operator, so-called gain operator, which realizes the feedback, is given again. It's by it's it's unbounded operator, heavily unbounded with respect to that. But operator P, it's in some sense smoothing. So that pr property of observation allows us to construct in some sense sense um, um, mitigate uh, singularity of the problem. Uh, and the feedback synthesis that we obtain, we obtain synthesis that optimal control should be star, uh, can be realized online via this Riccati operator that comes from the, as a solution here. Um, uh, in terms of this product of two operators, there is the operator G, which it looks pretty uh, scary because there's a lot of unboundness here, but P is smoothing. So that's exactly what allows us somehow to handle. Uh, times a classical gain operator, which is in a, will be in a classical boundary control theory, but there is a D minus one. So one, one main thing is to assert invertibility of that operator. So it's a bounded invertibility. Invertibility, it's amazing because it is really related to the solution, to so unique solvability of a certain singular control problem, even in ODs, even at the level of ODs, okay, that problem persists. And we can show injectivity uh, and then later to show also uh, bounded invertibility. So as you see, there is a Riccati equation, which is uh, formulated and feedback is online optimal control given in terms of optimal trajectory times this gain operator, uh, which is well-defined. So conclusion is that we solve the original high frequency ultrasound problem with rough controls, with L2 controls. Uh, the observed quantities are always well defined, but dynamics is rough. So it means that derivatives and second derivatives of the pressure are certain distributions. Uh, and we obtain existence of solutions to non-standard Riccati equation. Uh, and we obtain also feedback syn synthesis. Uh, online control. So essentially, this is ready for calculation for numerics. Um, uh, of course, uh, many problems should be raised. First of all, to use this feedback control in a linear system and see what happened. How can you how can you really control a nonlinear equation with this L2 feedback? Uh, and, and such a feedback should also provide stabilizing effect on nonlinear dynamics, at least locally. Um, and of extension of the story to more general observation operator, because here we are just minimizing the uh, profile of the pressure, um, which was uh, instead if you are introduced, if you introduce uh, other quantities, 
then there is a lot of, a lot of structure using the proof, so it's not really, uh, that is true for every R, okay, R has a certain, certain structure in our, in our proof. But to generalize the thing uh, using this formula, it's also uh, right now an open problem and probably worth looking at least uh, in some cases. Um, so I would like just to thank uh, for your attention and I have here references for uh, works you know, which were here. Uh, uh, these are the two papers about uh, asymptotic behavior. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Elena. Very, very interesting talk. I don't know if somebody has a comment or a question. Please raise your hand or uh, Jean-Pierre, please. Uh, uh, my question is about the definition of the stabilization, the stabilization parameter gamma. At the beginning, there is a C square in the numerator and at the end, the C square is in the denominator, so. No, just a second. Um, no, gamma is, okay, gamma is defined, uh, gamma is for stabilization is defined as a uh, alpha, which is a it, frictional it, damping minus tau c square over b. Okay, at the, at the end it was over c square, so, okay. Oh, no, no, the, over c square was something else, it was because okay. when you change the variables to the time so, derivative in general, to the, in this case, I assume c difference than zero. If it's zero, it's just the, the time so, derivative. C is a speed of sound. Yes. So uh, gamma can be uh, easily negative or either... gamma, gamma can be negative. For well yeah, yeah. or linear thing, gamma can be negative. Yes, because C square is, is large. Yes. And it's minus yeah. C square over B. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Gamma can be negative uh, and, uh, you know, tau can be also negative. Uh, okay. Sorry, no, no. Gamma, gamma can be negative, but... This is true. And you know, there are some applications in models of thermoviscoelasticity. Quantamilla, I think, has, has written a couple of papers uh, on modeling. And, and in fact, he comes with a situation when this is negative. Uh, this does not affect the analysis of a linear problem, uh, affects stability. OK. OK. Mm -hmm. Any other question, comment? Uh, Hao Ming Guyen, please. Thank you. It's very nice talks. So uh, I'm wondering, uh, you mentioned about the high frequency. I mean, the, the, the feedback motivation, motivated from Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and why the, the, the frequency in your, in your talk is, is, the, is the parameter K? Is that right? Yeah, K, K is parameter of nonlinearity. Nonlinearity, but, but yes. why mm -hmm. the frequency? Why, why the frequency parameter? Uh, no, I think the freq frequency is, is uh, it is related in terms of the modeling, you know, to, because it's it's related to the to the environment, yeah, yeah, yeah and that, that's exactly the way this uh, waves acoustic waves interact. Yeah, because usually when when uh, when I, I think about high frequency, I want to see something about the ge geometrical optics. Oh, no, no, but this is not related. No, high frequency, what you have in mind is when you simply look at the symbol of differential operator and um, you, you just look at the high, you know, high mode, so to speak, yeah? Okay, okay. okay. No, no, this, this comes from physics. Pedro Jordan is probably here, will be the best reference for the modeling. He works for the Navy and he has done only essentially work for probably over, over 20 years on this, on okay. this equation. I believe that. Uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the question. Yes, another point. I mean, uh, you mentioned a very nice way to 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 find the hidden regularity. Yeah. Or the way equation, and and we can apply that method for for any evolution equation, or there is some. Oh yeah, I'm just look. The method itself is very straightforward. What it is, it is really following a hyperbolic system type of, of approach that you are solving Cauchy problem on the boundary. Yeah. Okay. So, it, so it's a very very standard mathematics yeah, in PDEs. Where, where I can find the reference for that? Uh, okay, the best, the best reference, uh, very useful, is the book by Sakamoto. Okay. Okay, when she provides all, okay, there is, there is one thing that perhaps to, to keep in mind. Uh, uh, 
problems with the dirich boundary condition are the one with so-called Wopatinsky condition is satisfied, as a way of saying is a Christ Sakamoto condition satisfied. Mm -hmm. It is simply that the boundary condition determinantally is a symbol. Neumann problem doesn't, yeah. So, the, so what Sakamoto does uh, essentially for Wopatinsky condition satisfied, okay? Otherwise, Tataru has a works, you know, uh, where he had, when he look at the wave equation with Neumann. So that was probably the most recent work when, in fact, he proved that some of the results are, were obtained later, uh, similar. But this is all in frequency domain, yeah. This is all Fourier variable, pseudo differential yeah. operators. Okay, thank but you very much. The book is very, it's a very good reference. Okay, 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 mm -hmm. I will look at it. Okay, thank you. Any other question or comment? Yes, uh, I have a question on on the first part of your talk. But, uh, yeah. Before all, thank you very much for your nice talk. It's been very, very, very nice. And thank you for your participation in the seminar. And uh, my question on the first part of your talk is, uh, well, you mentioned that the, there is a, a global existence in time when you take a small initial data. Yeah. So my question is, is if this is independent of the dimension, can you can you say something better? No, no, there, it's not true. Uh, it, no, there is there is of course relation to dimension because there is a sample of embedding there. Huh? It is certainly up to three uh, because that that relates to H two being embedded in the space of continuous functions. So otherwise, you know, you have to you have to simply look at the higher energy levels. One, one thing that with the smallness that at the beginning, the, the original works were assuming smallness on all this initial data with respect to the energy space. But then later it became clear that if you want to use density and other tools, you have to really reduce the small, you have to bargain. You cannot really afford smallness. You can, so question is how small is small? So the small should be only in the very first energetic level when you have a nice invariance. Uh, without okay. assuming the derivative, uh, higher derivatives. Okay, okay. And that's a technical thing to get. Okay, and uh, the, the, I have another question for the last part, uh, when you mm -hmm. have been speaking about the control problem. So my question is, uh, which, why is it important to take an infinite uh, time, uh, T star? What, why infinite what time? What does it mean? Yes, uh, from the practical no, yeah, point, yeah, why that, is it important? That, that's true for every, essentially, for every problem you know, with infinite horizon. Uh, one thing that allows you to uh, control the transient time, because for example, you have some procedures, okay? They take certain number of hours or minutes, okay? You would like to know what is the effect. Uh, so you would like to know what happened is the time is longer, whether this is going to be effective, yeah? Uh, what, what is your cost? What is, what is your you know, final outcome observation? So in that sense, having an infinite time allow, gives you techniques of really following the time and getting an estimate on the, which depend on time without fixing a priori. Okay, so okay. This, this okay. is one, one of the reasons because otherwise you can say, oh, like a stabilization, it's also time to go to infinity. So it's not really what happens at infinity because we are not going to live anymore, yeah? But what happened between, we get there. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I see, Th thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We will put the slides if you send them to us. Yes. PDF, yeah. PDF will be okay. Eh? Yes, the PDF, please. So the easiest this one. way we can consult the, the, the slides, no? Okay, very good. No, that's a good idea. Well, thank you very much. I think yeah. it's time. At, at least I have to teach, so sorry. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> for your attention. Thank you very much for your very nice yes. talk. Thanks. I, I think it was very clear and interesting. So thank you, thank you all. Thank See you. you next week.